Great. All right, greetings everyone and welcome to tonight's session of Ready for Pre-K. Um, our session this evening is for families who wanna be allies talking to young children about race. My name is Drew and I work in the Early Childhood Division here at DCPS. I'm also a proud DCPS Pre-K parent. All right, so before we get started this evening, there are a few housekeeping items that I wanted to go over with the group. Throughout the session, we invite you to enter your questions and comments into the chat. Please note that these will only be seen by the hosts and moderators, not the entire group. We have Courtney and Melissa on who are our chat moderators this evening, um, and they'll be pulling questions to raise up to Dr. Baxley throughout the presentation. And then also during the Q&A portion at the end. Um, we will keep all of those questions and comments anonymous, so we encourage you to be vulnerable with that. This session is recorded um, and will be posted on the DCPS YouTube page. So for that reason, we have disabled the microphone and camera features for our guests. And then some community agreements for us. Um, we like to start off all of our Ready for Pre-K session with some general community agreements for our time together. We are really committed to making sure that this forum is a place where everyone feels safe, welcome and respected. We want to acknowledge that families are complex and have different experiences and are in different places on their journey to becoming allies. So we ask that everyone extend um, some kindness, patience, and show up with open hearts and open minds this evening. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Courtney, from the equity team to get us started this evening. Thanks, Courtney. Hello, everyone. Um, so here is our DCPS Becoming Purpose Statement. Um, DCPS is the fastest improving district in the country, yet still has significant disparities for students of color, special education students, and English language learners. And we know those disparities are not the result of inherent deficits in students, so we must transform our system and practices to support students furthest from opportunity so they can reach their full potential. That's our Becoming Statement. So they Thank you all for showing up and to engage in this conversation and do this work. DC Public Schools is committed to becoming a whole child anti-racist school district and that's what this becoming purpose statement is about. This work takes all of us and we know that families are children's first and most important teachers. We believe that conversations about race should be happening at home for all children long before they begin school. We believe that conversations about race should start early, happen often, recognize and celebrate difference differences, build a positive sense of self and identity, and normalize conversations about race from an early age. Sometimes those conversations can be challenging, so we want you to know that you are not alone. Our teams are so happy to offer some resources to assist you with these conversations, starting with today's session. So with that, we are so excited to have Dr. Tracy Baxley here with us this evening. She is a mother and educator, a belonging advocate, and she is the author of the amazing book, Social Justice Parenting, How to Raise Compassionate, Anti-Racist, Justice-Minded Kids in an Unjust World. Um, and if you don't already, you should follow her on social media. I'm a parent as well and have been following her for a while. And I, I'm so happy to get to welcome her today. So Dr. Be Dr. Baxley, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Courtney. Thank you, everybody. I'm excited to be a part of your anti-racist journey as a district. Uh, it's so important to for families and for children. So I guess without further ado, are we ready for me to share my slides? Yes. Yep. All right, Go for let's, it. Let's do it. I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> okay. I'm hoping you guys are able to see my slides at this point. Yep, yeah, looks good. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you for showing up. I know how busy we all are, right, as parents with little ones, um, with big ones, um, with jobs. It's very uh, 
I understand how hard it is to get here. And I'm really appreciative and very grateful that you uh, decided to spend an hour of your time here with us today. Um, just uh, um, Drew went over already kind of um, some basic guidelines. And I, and I just want to kind of reiterate that in this space, there's no shaming, there's no guilting, um, there's no judgment. Um, we're all here to learn and we're all here to support each other on, on our journey um, to really making the world a better place for all of our kids. So just a quick overview of what we have and what we're gonna be getting to in the next 40, 45 minutes is uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about fear-based parenting, what it is and how we kind of get unstuck from that. Uh, we're gonna lean into this idea of privilege um, and kind of demystify it and taking some of the, I, I would say negative uh, views around um, privilege. And then we'll go into a small section on uh, research on toddlers and race, because that's the age group we're really trying to dive into, you know, that we, there's a little bit, uh, there's things already out there on preschoolers, um, but I really want to kind of focus a little bit on those that are a little bit younger um, than preschoolers. Obviously, what we talked about today can also be used with preschoolers, but particularly we're going to look at the toddler age and, um, and then what you can do, you know, some practical things that you can walk away with and, and hopefully um, put into practice when you get off of this uh, Zoom call. All right, so if you, um, if we're really gonna address racial issues with our children, we really have to begin by engaging in self-reflection. Um, and sometimes when we're looking at where we've been, who we are, um, and the ways that we think, um, and the ways that we really wanna protect our children, it really starts with us addressing our fears. And one of the biz biggest obstacles really to doing ally work or anti-racist work is really working through fears. And fear really can come in different ways, right? Sometimes people feel like talking about race with kids, it's uh, taking their innocence or stripping them of their innocence. Um, there's a fear around change just in general. There's a fear around um, maybe causing some uneasiness within our families or our inner circles. There may be fears around, you know, um, getting it wrong, right? Saying the wrong thing to our kids or offending people that we're trying to be allies with. Um, there's a fear of not knowing enough. There's a fear of backlash. Um, and we really need to work out how do we get past that fear in order to be able to start taking action. And so um, sometimes that fear can really get in the way of us doing what's, what's really best for our kids, um, even though sometimes we don't recognize it. Um, it really keeps us from taking risks um, and to really kind of thinking out of the box when it comes to raising our children. And um, fear can also keep us sometimes on the sidelines, right? It keeps us from growing. And um, change is hard, but change is needed in order for us to grow. So what does fear look like, you know? Uh, one way that we can think about fear, um, and, and I'm talking specifically for, uh, for white parents right now, um, sometimes that fear is really about how we keep our kids in these protective bubbles. Um, I don't know, have you ever said or heard somebody say, I just want to protect them from, from, I just want to protect their innocence, or I just want to keep them in this bubble for as long as I can. Um, I don't know if you've thought about how long that bubble should last or at what age is it safe for you to then start having these conversations? But I can tell you this as a black mom, um, I don't really get, get to have that choice. Um, the bubble is not true for me um, and it's not true for a lot of people. It's a false protection that really may end up hurting more than it's helping. So I want us to start rethinking about how we are protecting our kids and let's think more about less protecting and more preparing them. Sometimes your fears can show up as silence, right? You don't want to talk about race or other hard topics with our kids. Um, so sometimes we ignore it or we just uh, omit this idea of race-based conversations with our kids or with our families in general. It's easier just to not talk about it. But if you really are serious about raising anti-racist children, um, you can't choose silence, right? That silence in itself really sends a very loud message to our kids. And I don't think it's the message that you're trying to send or trying to teach. Um, and I know if you're here tonight, it's something that you, you're not trying to teach your kids, right? So we want to really think about how we can start having the conversation so our children will know 
how important it is for us to have um, support people who, who look different from us or to create a world where everybody feels like they belong and they feel safe. And having conversations around it really is the first, first um, in, entry point to really doing that. Sometimes our fears may be disguised in the term, you know, the colorblind term, we don't see color. Um, I think in the last two years, we're starting to un unpack that a little bit and get around that more. Um, but if we're being honest, we know our kids, they see color, right? They show us every day. They tell us every day what they see around them. Um, and the color blindness really is very dangerous. Uh, ignoring color, right? You are essentially ignoring the lived experience and the racial inequity that exists in society. Um, and honestly, I need your children to see my children. To be visible really means that you acknowledge my experiences and you, you acknowledge my, my, um, my hurts. Um, and then I know that I matter to you. I know that my children matter to you. So we're going to talk about really how to be more intentional, you know, not to leave these conversations for others to have with your kids, you know, social media, other kids, um, society at large. We uh, really want to know that we are pouring into our children those values about racism and inclusion and diversity um, and not leaving that to chance for other people. So just, uh, just, you know, just I want you to see it from another perspective. Um, as a Black woman and as a Black mother, my fears really may look different from, from some of yours. Um, my protection really focuses on me having what Black families often call the talk with their children very early. I've had started having these conversations with my children really um, for, as, for as far back as I can remember, three and four-year-olds. When they were three and four year olds, I was um, having conversation about what it feels like and what it looks like to live in their black skin. Um, these talks are really a series of conversations that we have with our children from the time they're young until they really go off to college. And the talk includes um, preparing them for racism, discrimination, and stereotypes, but it also includes how we educate them about being proud um, to be in their skin. You know what what their ancestors did, right? That was positive. And so there's a combination. I mean, I think it's in, in, in media, it just talks about the negative things that we have to tell our kids, but we also really give them a psychological armor in a positive way too, really, so they can navigate in the world. Um, some of the things that I've said to my own kids growing up is trying to explain to them how beautiful their skin is, how, how their hair is uniquely created. Um, that they're just as good as anybody else and um, they're no different because based on the color of their skins. I've even had to have conversations with my kids about not putting their pot, hands in their pockets while they're in stores and um, about always getting a receipt. Like if my child is in the store getting a pack of gum or a bottle of Gatorade, I tell them to always walk out with a receipt. Um, I don't want them to ever be in a situation where they're being blamed for, for something that they didn't do. So these are really things that we always have conversations with our kids about. Um, the idea of, I tell my kids not to wear hoodies outside. Um, and I teach them how to behave um, and how to move in their bodies if they're ever pulled over by law enforcement. So these are conscious efforts, intentional conversations that I'm often having with my kids as reminders of who they are where they came from, and then how they may have to navigate in the world. So these talks really are about building positive racial identity and it, as much as it is about keeping them safe in a very um, racialized society. So if you've never had to have those kind of conversations or you've never thought about having those kinds of conversations with your kids, um, I need you to recognize that that really is a, a, a place of, of privilege. And I want to um, break down this, this word privilege because there's a lot of um, negativity around the word. Um, there's a lot of um, using this word really for, for negative gain, um, to separate, to, to make people feel guilty, to make people anger, to, to divide. And um, I really want to unpack this a little bit and really think about 
privilege in a different way. It's kind of a, a mind shift as to how we look at privilege. It should not be used as a word that weaponizes us in so many ways. Um, and I really want to change a the narrative there. So if, as we walk in our skins or in our um, in, in, in this in the US, right? We all have multiple identifiers that we are associated with us based on our race or gender or class, ethnicity, um, religion, sexual orientation, our ability, all those things make up who we are. And in all of those identities, <coughs> excuse me, we are either privileged in some or in some we're marginalized. Um, this dichotomy really changes based on where we're located and the time period in which we are living, right? Um, so I'm gonna use my own identity really to kind of drive the point here about privilege. Um, in the US currently, as a black woman, those are identifiers that are traditionally marginalized for me, being a woman and being black. And I hold less power societally in those identities. But my other identities like uh, being upper middle class, heterosexual, cisgendered, Christian, those are all identities that I hold privilege, right? I don't have any guilt for that. I don't have any shame about there. But there's nothing that I've done really to earn those privileges. It's just a system that's current, right? The system that we live in that gives me privilege in some of those areas. And so anti-racist work is, has a lot to do with acknowledging your white privilege, right? Your privilege in terms of race. And so let's reframe the idea of privilege being a weapon um, and let's look at it more as a tool for change. So you should be asking your question, asking yourself the question, how can I use my privilege in whatever identity that is to support and stand with those who do not have the same privilege in that particular identity? Right now we're talking about race, but we could really interject any of those identities that I just named as a place to, to say, how can I use this identity as a tool for, for change? So by engaging in anti-racist work, you are making a conscious choice to really use your privilege of race as a tool for change against racism. Um, and you're teaching your kids to do the same, to make those same choices. And if we are indeed teaching our kids to use these, to make these choices and to do the same thing, we need to unpack what we know about children race currently. So children are really learning about race and racism every day. Um, no matter how quiet we are, no matter what bubble we're putting them in, no matter how we wanna practice color blindness, our kids are eating it up every day. And research shows us that really children began to form these race related ideas long before we're ready to have those conversations with them. This awareness of race really begins as early as infancy. There's a lot of studies that show between the age of six and 12 months, babies are already showing a preference for members in their own racial groups. By the time they're seven months, they, um, when things are uncertain or they feel a little bit anxious, they're more likely to follow the gaze of a member of their own race. And by the time they're nine months, they really associate positive, happy music from this study um, with those people who are from their own race and the equivalent of that is looking at other races and faces with sad, associating that with sad music. And so we see already before we are even thinking about having conversations with our children, they are picking up messages around, around us in society that really start to get them to make, the, make decisions about uh, race-based issues or race-based identities. Um, the researchers also in these studies suggest that there's a pattern that develops as a, as a result of a lack of exposure, right? So when kids are young, they only mostly see people who look like them. And so that is kind of the reason why um, early on we see the studies that show that infants are have a more propensity to um, gravitate to people who look like them. And so um, by the time they're in preschool, they're, they've already become even more observant and the differences such as skin color and hair texture, they're noticing it more and more. And they um, are often asking these questions, right? They're starting to develop really a racial bias already. Kids at this age in preschool, they start to show what's called in-group bias, which means they prefer people um, to choose friends um, 
with people who look like them. And so when they have a choice, they are leaning more toward people who look like them, um, choosing them as friends, choosing them as um, to play with in school. And so they're also starting to ask a lot of questions about differences. Sometimes that's embarrassing for us as parents because we're not sure how to answer it, but they are curious. And these questions are really, they're trying to connect, make the connections between the categories that they, that are, that's happening in their schema. Um, and they're trying to make sense of the world around them. And they start to get more sophisticated with their categorizing, um, but their, their experiences are still very limited. So there's a lot of misinformation uh, that's going on with our preschoolers. Um, I, I, just as an example, if we look at like who the superheroes are, who the princesses are, things are getting better. But if you look at who those people who are good versus evil, um, of those people who are in charge in a lot of the shows that they watch, there are some societal, societal messages that they are picking up, even though we're not having those conversations about them. And so preschoolers are using what limited schema that they, they have to really try to make sense of the world around them. And you can see I skipped the toddler age um, on this slide because I really want to dive a little bit more deeply into um, what we're finding in studies and research in early childhood about what's going on with toddlers and race. So, <coughs> excuse me, there's extensive research that really supports this notion at this young age that toddlers are really making racialized conclusions about what they know, uh, the limited knowledge that they have about the world. Um, racism is really learned early in their development. And children really are receiving these messages about race and racism from places that we, we can't even imagine. Um, Beverly Tatum, who is a racial identity um, theorist and professor, she always talks about this idea of racism being like smog, right? It's all over us, even though we don't see it, even though we don't necessarily know it's there, we're all breathing it in and it's hard to clear it. Um, so sometimes we're, we are, um, our kids are seeing racist ideas around us because it is part of the society, right? It's become normalized in society that we don't even recognize it anymore. So within the first years of, of a kid's life, they're really bombarded with these messages from the environment that really shape their beliefs or judgments about other people, especially people who are different from them. Um, and it doesn't take long for these messages to really kind of stick and we have to do due diligence to unstick it for them because they've already connected these things in their brains and we have to remind them and keep teaching them in order for it to unstick. Um, toddlers use, we know they use a lot of social cues such as body language and facial expressions to really make sense of the world. So at, at this age, they are really watching us. They're watching the way we respond. Um, you know, how are you responding when somebody who's of a different race gets on the elevator with you? How are you responding driving down certain neighborhoods? What is your body language telling your kids? Um, they're watching the way that we move. They're, they're mimicking our attitudes and our racial biases without us really even knowing it. And so what that means is we have to really engage in some self-reflection, right? So that as we are navigating in the world, we have to be mindful of the ways um, that we are expressing ourselves non-verbally and what we are putting out for our kids to, to, to pick up. Um, research also shows us that as early as three, toddlers really associate their racial groups with negative traits. They're already doing that. And they use these associations to develop their own understanding of the world. There's uh, a group of professors at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. They found that at age three, white children were equally likely to befriend black or white ch children. But by the time they were four and five, right? You're just talking about 12 or 24 months later, white children are more likely to choose other white kids as friends. So this toddler year, year is really important for us to lay the foundation of what our values are when it comes to race and race-based issues. Also at Yale University, the researchers found that by the age that kids were three, um, white American children were more likely to associate both Black and Asian faces with anger, while they were rating white faces with more positive emotions. Um, the interesting thing about this study is that when Black 
children didn't show the same in-group preference. So what this suggests is that this is not something that's like implicit bias, that it's not, you know, a not conscious, but that kids are really picking up this idea of what status hierarchy is in our, in our culture, um, where privilege comes from, and who has more power. So the fact that white children were able to um, make this distinction and black children did not really show that um, it's more than just this implicit bias, but it really is the messages that they're picking up about who's in power and who's not in power. So the good news is that no one is born racist, right? And as parents, we can always counter these societal messages where our children are learning about racism. So they're malleable, um, they are curious and ready to learn. And so we can always continue to make sure that we are reinforcing these things for our kids so that we are raising kids who are indeed anti-racist. Um, we can really start this by really thinking about how we socialize our children around race, right? It really has to be a conscious effort. As children learn, as children grow and learn, um, these messages about race come from all, all corners, right? Social media, um, news, entertainment, their teachers, their peers, their community, and of course, family members, right? So all children, including white children, learn about race through this process called racial ethnic socialization, which just means that the beliefs, the messages, um, the practices that we instruct in our children about their racial and ethnic heritage and their identity. So it's how we're teaching our kids about who they are. So the researchers show that there's four different common aspects that families are teaching us with their kids. The first one is cultural socialization, which means we're teaching our kids to be proud about who they are, right? We're teaching them positive identity. The second one is preparation for bias. So these are discussions that you have with your kids about that discrimination really exists in the world, that things are not fair, and how do we deal with those things? The third way that we have conversations about race with kids is this promotion of mistrust, right? So we're teaching children to be weary of people who look different from them or in different environments. And then the fourth way is this way of looking at the world as if really the color blindness um, of uh, that we are one human family. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's valuing us as a whole versus really looking at different racial, uh, individual racial groups. And then uh, families of all racial and ethnic backgrounds really draw on all of these strategies, but it shows that the research shows that mostly uh, white families are drawn from this one of the four, right? And we have black families who really, on the other hand, they have to use these other ways of talking with kids about race because of the racialized world that we're living in. And so I want you to, to, to be conscious about thinking about your own way that you were raised, right? A lot of uh, white families didn't talk specifically about race. Um, and then how, what do you wanna pass on to your children? What do you want the messages that they get um, when they become adults to um, reflect how you talked about race um, in your homes. So sometimes when we embark on new ways of being or new ways of showing up for ourselves, we, uh, and definitely for our kids, right? We get stuck sometimes and we get paralyzed in some of our actions. And although it's really important for us to start teaching anti-bias messages as early as we can, it's also really valuable for children to understand that those racist beliefs are not permanent. And I want you, as you start on your journey or if you, as you deepen your journey as anti-racist, there's six things that I really want you to keep in mind for yourself, right? When those familiar fears start to rear their heads and really for your, for your children as you start to have these conversations. The first thing is small steps that move, move you forward. Um, you don't, you're not expected to know everything. You're not expected to, um, to have all the right answers. So really start taking small actions. They still count. And over time, small steps really move mountains, right? So don't be afraid. Don't think that um, you doing a little bit is not enough. The second thing is activism can be quiet. 
So expand your ideas around this idea of activism in the quiet spaces of your homes, in the quiet spaces of your children's bedrooms, sitting on a chair at your kitchen table. Those are activist um, actions, right? Activism is happening. Reading and having dialogue around inclusive books with your children, um, writing emails or letters to your local politicians, all of those things count and they're all part of being an activist in your community. Um, sending donations to anti-racist organizations, buying from black owned businesses, those are all part of the journey. So don't think that you have to take your kids on rallies every time. There's a lot of ways for us to show up for other uh, cultures, particularly in the black community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's more than one way of being an anti-racist, right? So find your passion, find the project that feels right for you and your family or the issue that really lights you up and discuss ways that you can really make a difference based on that one organization or that one topic with your, with your family, with your inner circle really, and then dive deep within that one, one topic or that one um, passion. Also being an activist or an act of anti-racist, it's not a checklist, it's not temporary, and it's not on trend. I saw a lot of people during the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd um, kind of put their black squares up or were active for a period of time, but really, um, they really haven't done anything since then. So anti-racist parenting or activism is really ongoing. It's really a daily practice of what we're putting into our children every day, showing up in a way, showing up in a space where we are saying to ourselves, how am I intentionally planting the seed in my children so that they grow up in a way that they um, create belonging in the world? Um, and then the fifth one is it's not easy and you will feel uncomfortable. So be ready, be ready and be willing to really kind of keep working through it. Um, it, if it feels easy, really, I think you should re-examine the way you're doing it. Um, if it gets too easy, it may mean that you're not pushing yourself enough. So you should always lean on, teeter on this idea of being comfortable and uncomfortable and really continue to push yourself to grow. Um, and then the last thing is you're going to make mistakes. When you make a mistake, you apologize, you learn from it, and you move on. Don't get lost in the mistakes. Don't over-apologize, even to your kids. You're going to make mistakes with your kids as you're explaining, as you're growing, as you're learning. Um, and just stay mindful of that so that you don't make those mistakes again and you continue to grow. And I think really finding safe spaces like this one, really, where you can do the work, you can be vulnerable, um, all of that is important to the process that you can lean on others who are also trying to do the work. A lot of kids really don't have the freedom of being aware of their differences, but it's, um, it's on my mind all the time, right? I'm always thinking about how my kids show up, if they'll be welcome in a space, can I take my children there? And I think what something that we need to do, um, something as white parents I think need to do is really put themselves in positions where they may feel that too. Um, the idea is really to not normalize diversity and not really um, other people while you're doing it. Really uh, this idea of appreciating and learning from others whose perspectives are different is how we really start to begin to build a better world. And it's really important that children are learning to value these different viewpoints and that we are teaching our children um, that diversity really makes the world richer and more interesting and really more beautiful. So try to create opportunities for you and your little ones to really interact and make friends with people who are different from you. And I think the best way to really understand one another is really to spend time with each other. It really does break down walls. So um, when I see adults really developing these relationships with people who are different from them. When your kids see that, when you're modeling that for your kids, it teaches them how to value these relationships. And as you know, children really learn best um, with concrete um, experiences, right? They need to see it. They need to practice it. They need you to model those things from, for them in order for them to really be able to take those in in their own lives and really, um, really own it and learn. Um, we have to expose our kids to things that are new and different, um, even things that are new and different for you. For, for you, um, Trying to expose them to role models from their own culture as well as others. I think it's really important to have professionals in your life who don't look like you 
like your pediatrician, uh, your kid's dentist, your children's coaches or teachers or dance teachers, whoever they are, right? You, you wanna normalize that excellence comes in different ways. And so if all of your, your, all of the adults that your children come in contact with look like you, that's something that's an easy fix for you, right? That's something that you can do to make some changes in your immediate, immediate circles. Um, really exploring outside your neighborhood. I mean, DC is one of the most diverse areas in our country. There's treasures out there. It's really important that your kids get to see what that looks like um, and not having them in the same in the same bubble if you only live around people who look like you. So venture out, um, do things that may scare you a little bit, go into libraries that are not in your neighborhood, um, go to cultural events and places that you can take your kids to so they can see and they can normalize people that look different from them. And um, honestly, representation matters. So when you think about even the things that are in your house, like the faces on diaper boxes or food containers or the packaging that you have in your homes, right? If they all look like you, um, it's sending a message to your kids, even at a young age, that uh, diversity may not be as important to you as you, you think it is. And then the other thing is, um, really, it's about doing the work, right? Get informed, learn a, uh, the inclusive language that you need and the terms. I know things are always changing, right? The terms and the language that we use when we're talking about others always changes, but that's important for you to stay up on top of it, right? As you're learning and you're growing, your confidence about topics that normally would scare you. Um, it's important for your family that you do the work. And a lot of the things when it comes to diversity and racism with toddlers, it's really about the way that you show up. Um, it's about what you model. It's about what you learn so that as they grow, that you're teaching them the things that you're learning and you're feeling more comfortable about it. Um, talking about people's diversity really heightens your children's awareness. It gives them a maturity about things like race and disability. Um, don't be afraid to really have these hard conversations early because it may not resound or resonate with them right away, but the more you're having it, the more it's going to click for them and they're going to be able to make the, the right connections between what they see in the world and what's important to you and the values that you have in your household. I think it's also important that we actively look for subtle openings that create opportunities for us to talk about diversity with our kids. Use the moments in our homes, the materials that we already have at our disposal, right? Our neighborhoods, um, the books that we have in our homes, um, the commercials on TV, the TV shows that we watch. You can have conversations around those things as your kids are watching, getting them to notice different things. I also think it's really important that um, the stereotypes that we see in media sometimes are subtle for kids, but over time, as you start having conversations about it, they will start to pick those things up so they don't internalize them. So having some media literacy around common everyday stereotyping is a real big part of media consumption um, that you are allowing your kids to watch. Um, you may find that your child is kind of repeating some things that they may have heard on TV that may not align with your core values, um, but it's really important that we don't overreact because this will shut down their curiosity, right? It will shut them down for asking questions or making comments in the future. And we really don't want that. But the idea too is that you don't want to ignore it because ignoring it, it solidifies to them that what they're saying is right. So really you don't want to overreact, but you don't want to ignore. You want to bring it to their attention, but you want to teach them in a way that they feel open and they don't feel attacked by it. Um, we want to teach our kids to be uh, critical thinkers to understand issues, examine and question, and that's all through their natural curiosity. When we start shutting down their natural curiosity, they stop asking questions. They stop thinking in a way that um, allows them to be more creative. So they can develop these skills really, um, and they really have a good sense of when somebody is hurt or something that's unfair. And we want to kind of lean into that and teach them the vocabulary that they can use to kind of talk about these things. Um, remember that their questions and their comments 
are really a way of them gathering information. So don't be embarrassed by something they may say um, and don't feel that what they're asking you is stemming from um, a way of them being prejudiced or biased, right? They're just trying to understand the world around them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, and as I just said, you know, it's really important that we embrace their curiosity. They have a lot on their minds, even at two and three, right? And they have a lot they wanna talk about and they wanna share. Um, and it's really important for us as parents during this time is that we are really listening to what they're trying to tell us. Um, sometimes it's, it's easy to be impatient, um, but it's really important that they feel nurtured at that time because what it does is open up the communi communication. So as they get older, those conversations are easier for them and they feel that you've always listened to them um, and they have a safe space to go to when, when they do want to talk. Um, it's really important not to over parent, which is a real issue today. We want to explain everything to our kids. We want to do it all for them. We don't want them to hurt. We don't want them to struggle. Um, but the more we listen and the more that we model for them, uh, the more that we can really teach them what it is that we want them to know that aligns with our core values. Um, so active listening is really important, even at this age. This way, you are allowing them to um, lean into that curiosity and that you're, you're providing a safe, safe place for them to be able to do that too. Um, you also don't want to underparent, which means that your kids, um, you're not redirecting your children when they have these comments or these questions that one, you may be uncomfortable answer or two, that they don't align with um, what it is that you really wanna teach your kids. So you're going to have to have conversations around that um, and not ignore when things come up that make you feel uncomfortable. And as they start to get a little older, um, they are gonna to start to ask more questions um, and more questions that you, you may not have the answers to. So you can always think about what you wanna to say to them. And if, it, if you don't say the right thing, that's okay too. You could say something like, um, I need to think about your question and talk, and, and I need to think about your, your question and maybe I need to talk to you a little bit later. Or like um, yesterday you asked me a question about whatever it is and let's talk about it now. Um, I don't really know, I, I really answered you the right way yesterday. Um, I've now thought about it or looked something up and I really wanna come back and have that conversation with you. What did you hear me say? So that you know where they are, where the gaps are. Um, and it's good that they don't, they see that you don't have the answers. You know, that's part of them learning too, that as they grow up, they don't need to have all the answers too. So when your kids are nonverbal, which some of your kids may be at one and two, um, it's really important that you start paying attention. Like maybe they're, they're pointing at something or maybe they're touching somebody else's hair, right? You can then reaffirm what they're doing and saying, but saying, oh yes, he has straight hair and you have curly hair. Or, you know, so you wanna make what they're thinking or what they're saying, what they're pointing to into a statement so that it makes sense for them um, as they grow up and they start to have language around that. And the other thing that's really important too is to talk to other parents who are also having the same questions, right? Talking to other people really kind of helps you to grow your own parenting toolbox um, and it makes you not feel like you're alone. So find a, a group of parents who are also trying to do the same thing and have the same values and raising their kids and use each other to lean on one another. And then finally, kids who really can put themselves in someone else's shoes are really less likely to bully, to tease, or to be bystanders when these things are happening. And so this, at this age, is done with you modeling, right? Talk to your kids about what they think um, about others, right? Ask them how would they feel if somebody was mean to them. Um, talk about what that feels like to you. Give vo vocabulary and language around things that make you sad or make you upset or make you, um, um, the things that you don't feel that's fair. So the more you're talking and giving them language, the more that language will connect to their own values as they begin to grow up. Um, the bottom line is that you really need to teach your kids that all people, 
um, despite their differences, they all deserve respect and they all have value. And if we overlook any kind of bigotry or any kind of racism, we're really sending messages to our kids that it's okay um, that they feel a certain way about certain groups. So to raise a real, a tolerant child, really, you need to help your child learn the values that everyone, um, everyone is, should be valued as a human being. Okay, so um, I want to close with a couple of slides that really kind of give you some more practical tips, perhaps that you can use with your with your little ones. Um, <coughs> it's really important that you extend your neighborhood to additional neighborhoods in your in your community. Um, it'd be really nice if you research and attend um, any festivals or activities in your community that really would expose your kids to differences on a regular basis. Um, one of the most common questions that I hear parents say or one of the comments that they say is that we just don't have time to add that to our schedule. And I, I always think you have time to schedule your kids' friends' birthday parties, sporting events, and all those things. You do have time to schedule it. Put it on the calendar once a month, and you know that's part of your monthly um, outings. Um, it's really important that our kids are exposed to differences early. Um, the second statement that I hear a lot, too, is that we don't live in an area where there's people of colors. And again, if you chose to get out of your protected bubble, DC is one of the most diverse places around. And so you may have to be more intentional about the way you bring diversity into people into your lives. Um, so, so think about how you can do this in a way that makes sense for your family, but that you're exposing your children to people who are different. Um, I think it's also important that as your children are watching things, it's important that you watch it with them because in this, in this way, you can highlight positive characteristics of people. Um, for example, if you're watching like, um, like Doc McStuffin, right? She's a black girl, but you could highlight how smart she is, how what a creative thinker she is without necessarily saying that she's black. So what you're doing is you are normalizing normal human characteristics positive characteristics to people of color. And I think that's really important that we don't always try to do anti-racist with um, teaching about blackness in ways that uh, it's just about blackness. But we also wanna make sure that we're teaching our kids that everybody has this human experience, right? Um, but you wanna expose them to different kinds of people having these um, human experiences. Also, I think it's really important that you are reading materials yourself, right? You are growing. As you're growing in your uh, comfortability, um, it's going to radiate and it's going to transfer into how you interact with your children. So consider the perspectives of different authors, right? If you're beginning your journey into anti-racist, it may be easier for you to read something from a white author. That's a great entry point. Um, like White Fragil Fragility by Robin D'Angelo could be a great start. Um, but don't make sure you don't stop there, right? You want to read authors of people who are um, living the experience of um, being Black in America, right? The Black experience. Um, and you can do this through books. You can do this through podcasts. You can do these through documentaries. Um, but it's a way of always being intentional about the way you're educating and growing yourself. And what you're learning makes it more comfortable when, it, when you're ready to have conversations with your, with, your, with your children. And so it's really just as much about your own learning as about what you're teaching for your kids. Um, you can't practice what you don't know. So now while your kids are young, it's really a great time to kind of dive into these things so that as your children grow, you will feel more comfortable with having some of these conversations. Other small things that you can do is really um, as you develop your play grade, play dates and your 10 story times at libraries, choose different libraries to go to, right? Some that you are not normally a part of. Um, I think it's really important too, as uh, white allies, as anti-racist, that you put yourself in situations where you or your family are not the dominant race. Um, I think it's good to feel what that feels like um, in order to be able to really 
stand with and support people in, in people of color um, in different communities. Um, and I know the low hanging fruit that you already know is about expanding your books and your toys and your children's collections. Um, when you talk about how characters are different, it's just as important to talk about how they're similar. Um, so kids can see the differences are great, yes, but there's also a lot of things that bind us together. So making sure you're, you're, you're uh, touching on both of those sides. Um, we know about diversifying our dolls and our toys, and, and this is not necessarily anti-racist, but I think it's really important that we buy boys dolls and we buy girls trucks, right? So we wanna make sure we're genderizing our, our toys and our books for our children as well. And then finally, um, some tips I would say is that, <coughs> excuse me, that we really should think about how we're using language to really represent our feelings. Um, I think we want to move our kids beyond the ideas of being happy, sad, and angry, that we want to really nuance our feelings so as they start to grow up and they start to learn about all of these things that are going on in the world that are not just that they really have the vocabulary to really connect what they're feeling to words so that they can express themselves to others. And I think the most important thing that we can do is really model for our kids what compassion and kindness looks like. Um, sometimes when we're doing a kind deed, we should talk out loud of what you did and why you did it so that your kids can start connecting that uh, action with the words, right? What they see and what they hear, making that connection. So, so using that idea of talk alouds. Um, and I think also we really need to, and I said this earlier, but I think I wanna kind of reiterate that it's really important that we are very cautious and very intentional about our nonverbals, especially when we're around people who are different from us. Those are the things that our toddlers are picking up first. More than the words that we say, it's our body language, um, it's our facial expressions um, because they begin to mimic us. And you want to be very careful about what your kids are mimicking um, when it comes to race issues or groups of people who are different from you. And then the final thing is really the bottom line at this age is you want to model the behavior that you want your children to exhibit when they get older. So it's not so much about what you're saying, but it's about the way that you're showing up so that your kids can see what's important to you um, because you can say that it's important to you but if they don't see you modeling those things um, it's not going to transfer to them as they start to grow older um, and start to to make more associations with the world around them okay I am going to stop sharing at this point and see if we have any questions thank you guys wonderful thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Baxley. Um, that was a lot of amazing information. I'm going to invite um, Courtney and Melissa on to ask um, some of the questions that were entered into the chat. And then we had some amazing questions, so they'll pull some of those as well. Um, I do want to remind everybody this evening that um, we did record the session and we'll post it. So if you weren't able to make it, you can view it on the DCPS YouTube page. And I'll also put up a slide in just a moment that has Melissa, take it away. All right, so one of the questions we got is, um, I'm scared of teaching my child the wrong things and having them repeat it and offend someone. So what word should I use when introducing the concept of race, like white, Caucasian, black, brown, African-American? What's the guidance? Yeah, I, I don't really think you have to use a term like that until it's necessary. Um, I would say this, though, um, when you don't know what people are in terms of the black community, when you don't know their background and you don't know their culture, using the term black is, is more um, inclusive um, and, and not African-American because you can have people who are from, uh, who are Caribbean, you're like, you know, Jamaican or um, Bahamian or, or um, you know, people from Africa. So I would use the, the word black if you are trying to identify a group of people. Um, and I think um, not so much getting hung up on the words, but, I think you need to kind of lean into the idea of teaching your children, exposing them to different kinds of people, right? They will start to ask questions eventually about skin color, 
Um, but I don't think you have to label it at this early age. I think um, exposing them and then talking about the skin color being different. I'm a big proponent of not really necessarily saying his skin is black, her skin is white, but I talk in terms of what makes it that color, like, right? We all have melanin in our skin. Some of us, some of us have more, some of us, of us have less, depending on where our ancestors or our families came from. So those are some words that you can use to teach them how to look beyond um, the labels that we, we use in, in our country. Thank you. Um, we had an interesting question about community helpers. Um, so a parent is wondering, what are some tips for talking about community helpers with young children, um, specifically law enforcement or police officers? Yeah, I, I think it's important for us to teach kids that police officers are, their role is to protect and serve. I think, generally speaking, that is something that we should be teaching our children. But I also think it's important to teach our kids that there are people in all walks of life that don't always make the right decisions and they don't always have the best uh, at the best at heart for everybody, right? So I don't want anybody to teach your kids to fear um, the po uh, police or law enforcement because the majority of people in law enforcement are good people who are doing the right thing. Um, but I, I, I think it's also important to say that sometimes um, just like uh, in every other job, you know, we have teachers, we have firefighters, we have police officers who don't, um, who make judgments about people based on how they look. Um, and sometimes it's based on their skin color. Um, so I, I would still talk about community helpers, um, but talk about it from the sense that most of them do the right thing all the time. But sometimes we have cases where um, it's not, it's not so. So I try not to teach my own kids too to, to, to fear police officers. I know when my kids were younger, especially my boys, when they um, when we would see a police officer in a neighborhood or at a restaurant, if we were eating, I would take my kids up to them and introduce them and say, thank you for protecting and serving. These are my kids, you know, just so my kids don't have a fear of police officers. But I, we also have a conversation about there's some bad apples, right, um, amongst the bunch and what that what that means for them um, as young black boys. There was another question that I really liked um, that was, what does allyship look like for young children? Yeah, I would look at it more, not so much what it looks like for young kids, but what it looks like for your family. Right, so whatever it looks like for your family are the values that you're gonna instill in your kids when they're young. Um, it may look like you uh, showing up for rallies, right? Um, it may look like you making donations, right? It may look like you collecting things and letting your children be a part of collecting things to take to organizations. And so I would say, wherever you lean into that with your own family, you make sure that your kids are a part of that. Um, so as they grow, they've learned what you've taught them. Um, and then as they get older, they may find their own ways of, of um, being a part of an allyship. But I think um, it looks like whatever it looks like for your family, and they should 100% be a part of anything that you're doing to support and to stand with uh, groups of people who are different from your family. Wonderful. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and as we answer that, I'm going to put up a slide that has all of our contact information on it. Um, and so that we hope you'll you'll keep in touch and that you'll reach out to us with additional questions and comments. Please don't forget to fill out um, our survey. The link is in the chat. The feedback um, that you give us helps to inform the content of these sessions. Um, and so we definitely want to hear from all of you as well. Um, so maybe one last question and then we'll we'll let you go. Thank you so much, Dr. Baxley. Yes, for sure. Dr. Baxley, I know we also have some of our amazing pre-K teachers on the call um, and they were wondering uh, what's the best way to talk about race in the classroom? Yeah, that's um, that one's hard. It's, it's even harder nowadays because of um, all the laws and all of the mandates that are going around. 
I'm in Florida. And so we are really having a hard time with that. I'm also a professor in teacher education. So me trying to teach teachers how to handle that and um, as they go out into the, to the field in the next year or two. Um, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think part of it is, a, is about exposure at this age, right? I think it may not be what you say, but it's what they see. So I think making sure that you are engaging in with books that are very diverse, um, I think is important that when you have a diverse classroom, that who that child is and their background is brought into the classrooms. I'm a big proponent of critical, um, of cultural, uh, cultural relevant teaching, um, cultural responsive pedagogy. Um, that's really important. <clears throat> and I think um, having relationships with your kids to know what's important to them um, and how they feel about certain topics is really important so that you can create instruction and curriculum that really supports the kids who are in your classrooms. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And with that, um, we'll leave everybody to have a good night and get back to parenting your young children. Um, and we hope that you will join us again um, for an upcoming session. This Again, this conversation has been the first of what we hope to be many conversations about this. So thank you guys for um, joining this evening. Dr. Baxley, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise um, and have a great night. Thank you.